I will be forever the myth. You're the king of kings, though. <laughs> <laughs> There's always a pecking order. The little peckers never mess with the big peckers. So I'm a rooster, and he's a chicken, so to speak. All right, welcome back to the Bodybuilding Legends podcast. I have my good friend Jerry Branham here with us again, and uh, we are still doing our reviews that we do at the beginning of each year. We go back uh, 50 years, 40 years, and 30 years. And so today, Jerry, we're up now to 1993, and we're going back 30 years, which was a really, really big year in bodybuilding. Um, so we're going to talk about the amateur shows today, and then we'll get into a discussion uh, probably next week about the uh, professional shows. So there's a lot of contests. I was looking over the, the year in review, and there was a lot, a lot of big shows. So bodybuilding was really big. Like if you compare 1983 to 1993, man, it really grew in that 10-year period. The really peak years of bodybuilding. I really, I mean, yeah. it was all over the place. Yeah. Internationally, nationally. And they had a lot of great bodybuilders of that era, too. Yeah. Yeah. The, the amateur shows were really big at that point. And... Um, the professional shows they had a lot more pro shows than they did in 1983 you know right well we've been getting some good reviews too Jerry. a lot of people have been talking about these uh year in review shows so a lot of people are giving us i'm getting a lot of emails uh, a lot of people yeah. love the stories and you know they love the, the what we're doing here but they like it yeah yeah all right well let's start talking about the amateur shows first in 1993 so um they still had three big uh, shows that were pro qualifiers in the 1990s. And those were the MPC USA, the MPC Nationals, and the MPC North America. So with the USA, you had to win the overall to get your pro card. And then the Nationals, you had to win your class. And I believe the North America, the North America was actually an IFBB show, it wasn't an MPC show. And it was a show that was with the uh, America and Mexico and Canada, three countries. And you had to win the overall there, I think, to get your pro card as well. So let's start with the USA, because that was the first one that took place that year. That was in July. And Chris Cormier, who went on to be a great pro bodybuilder, this was the show where he got his pro card. And he looked really, really good. Yeah. As a matter of fact, there was a guy who was, uh, this guy used to hang out with uh, Chris Cormier and Flex Wheeler. He used to come to the gym. I used to talk to him, an older guy. And I already knew Flex pretty well. I didn't know Chris Cormier at the time. I never even saw him. And I remember right before that contest, he came up to me. He says, Jerry, are you going to the USA? I said, yeah. He says, look out for this guy named Chris Cormier. Cormier. He, says, I, uh, he says he's better than Flex. <laughs> right away, I, I was skeptical. I said, no way. I, I said to him myself, there's no way this guy could be better than Flex Wheeler. Yeah. Said, I'm not saying he was better than Flex Wheeler, but he, you know, he sure as hell was in great shape. I mean, the, you know, the guy didn't lie. He was phenomenal. Yeah. yeah. Well, on one of our shows, we talked about the 91 uh, USA that Matarazzo won, and Chris was in that show. I think Flex got second at that one, and Chris was fourth. So I guess in 92, when Flex won, Chris was his training partner, as you said, and so he didn't want to compete against Flex that year, so they just – they put all their efforts into getting Flex ready, and then Flex won his pro card. So now ninety three was Chris's turn, and uh, he looked he looked really like he was so much bigger than he was in ninety one. I mean, he was yeah. big yeah. guy. Yeah. Chris Cormier chilling in the house, getting ready for the USA, baby. Well, this guy is noted for incredible strength. Chris Cormier from Los Angeles, California, originally from Palm Springs, two hundred thirty five pounds. Look at that shot there. Look, look at look at that package. Upper body, lower body, uh, just symmetrical, great condition. Uh, he's done his homework here. He was a great uh, champion wrestler and football player. I've seen this guy train in the gym, throws around amazing package uh, poundages. Uh, I'm I'm a fan of guys that uh, train heavy. This is one of the strongest bodybuilders I've ever seen. Well, he trains occasionally with Flex Wheeler. That'll. Uh make you disciplined that's a good training partner yeah uh, i've seen this guy incline uh, 500 pounds for a couple reps just amazing natural strength <laughs> thousand pound hack squat hack squat hack squats yeah that's uh that's difficult <laughs> that uh, that's would make most people's patella tendons pop right off the bone <laughs> 
<laughs> he, he's a strong one. It hurts something for me, I guarantee yeah. you. Yeah, the, you can see the uh, the heavy poundages in this guy's physique. So where do you figure Chris to finish tonight? He's right there. I mean, he's just in incredible shape, uh, not missing a body part, uh, very, very good presentation. Um, he's hit it. Well, as I mentioned, he was formerly from Palm Springs. Uh, I guess he started making trips out to Venice, California, and decided that was for him. So, came to Venice to train. I um, every time I went, I was traveling back and forth from Palm Springs to Venice, Palm Springs to Venice. I was making good connections with a lot of uh, photographers, writers, and just getting to know different people. And it seemed like a good move, so I tried it, and I've been here training for three years now. Well, the buzz backstage was that Chris Cormier was the man to beat. What do you think, Jim? Well, that might well be. Uh, you know, the kind of conditioning he has with the 235 pounds of muscle uh, looks phenomenal. Yeah, true. That's true. But he had great symmetry, too. I mean, he had really good legs. He had really good balance. And uh, I guess he you probably know this because you saw him in the gym. He was super strong, right? Like, he was benching, incline benching 500 pounds and... I mentioned he was a really strong, very heavy inclines and stuff of you. Very strong body below. And legs too, right? I remember like hack squatting seven plates or something. He's very strong. You yeah. Know. It's true. He had a he had a tough class. Mike Francois, who we're going to talk about in a minute, because he won the uh nationals that year. He was in second place, so he was coming on strong. And uh Paul DeMeo was third, and Craig Titus. The infamous Greg Titus was fourth, and uh, Dennis Newman was fifth. So it was a really stacked class. I think there was 14 heavyweights, but there was some really good guys. A lot of these guys would go on to be pros in the next couple of years, you know. It's funny that, that Titus beat Dennis Newman because in the USA, maybe a year or two later, I don't remember, you probably know, it was reversed. Dennis Newman beat Titus. It was in New Orleans. I was at that show. Oh, Okay. Uh, that's where I think I told you the story. Dennis Newman was after the show was backstage. They had a set up and they were taking photos and he had just, just won the contest. Literally stepped off the stage and they were taking the pictures and there was a girl there next to the photos. I'll never forget this. She was cursing at Dennis Newman as he was posing and everybody's looking and said, what is her problem? She's calling him all kinds of names. And Dennis was completely ignoring her. <laughs> Well, that happened. There was another incident when they announced Dennis Newman as the winner. Craig Titus, Titus threw a fit and started throwing things around the room and breaking things. Wow. Like I told you, I was covering the show from Weeder. My habit was always to go and interview all the guys, you know, to get little bits of information. I, I went, I made the mistake of going up to Craig Titus. <laughs> he more or less said, Get the fuck out of here. He goes, he, you know, <laughs> he hit me And I go, Wait, Craig, hey, Craig, great. Because I had always had a good relationship with the guy, you know? Yeah. I said, I'm just trying to help you. You know, I know you're pissed off. I wanted to give you a chance to express what you think. You know, you you know, this that's all I'm trying to do. And and he said, yeah, I don't want to talk. You know, a day later, two days later, I saw Titus in the gym and he was very apologetic. He apologized to me like a hundred times. Yeah. Said, okay, I don't take it personally. I know how hard you train for the show. You know, I know you dieted, you know, I mean, you, your nerves are on edge. I don't take it personally. Don't worry, I shook his hand, you know. Yeah. I and mean, by the way, I'm not going to visit you in prison. No, I didn't say that part. <laughs> <laughs> Remember when he lost to Phil Herndon in 95? So it was like two years after this. He yeah. was, I think he was favored to win the USA. And then that Phil Herndon was huge. Remember, he, he just passed away not too long ago. That's the way. He was a nice guy, too, Phil Herndon. Yeah. And I think he took his metal off and threw it on the stage and they suspended him for a year or something yeah titus had a really bad temper very yeah bad. yeah uh, like a when that happened with the you know with the murder of that girl uh, i was not really that surprised because you know i didn't know whether he had a hand in actually killing her but you know the fact that he was involved i said well i remembered seeing his temper tantrums mm -hmm. in that contest I said, I, I could see it. He's got a murderous temper. This guy probably lost control of himself, you know? Yeah, that was a shocking story, but I, I kind of wasn't surprised either when I heard it. Well, he was a hair trigger temper. I mean, you know? Yeah. A couple of guys once approached me in the gym when he was still competing, Craig, and they were cursing at him. You know, he wasn't there. They were telling me. I said, what are you so mad at Craig for? You know? They said, you know what this son of a bitch is doing? I said, what? 
He said he's selling growth hormone, but it's actually insulin. Mm. Selling it out of his car. I said, you got to be kidding me. He says, no. He says, I said, and I said to the guy, you realize how dangerous that is? Yeah, right. Growth hormone's not going to screw you up. You, you inject insulin, it could, could put you in a coma. Yeah. I said, I can't believe he'd do that to the guys he's working out with. And the guy says he is. Mm. I said to myself, gee, what a scumbag Mr. Craig is to do something. Yeah, yeah. Now, when did DeMeo get his pro card? Uh, good question. They called him Quad. Lonnie Teeper made the name Quadzilla for him. Oh, it was uh, the next year, in 94. I'm Paul DeMeo from Venice, California. I'd just like to thank my main man, Joe McNeil, and my wonderful girlfriend, Joe Greer. Quadzilla, they call him, Paul DeMeo. This guy's off-season weight, 270 pounds. He's got it down to 234 right now. Uh, can you really do that? Yeah, you can. Uh, you know, I think at uh, the pro level, you want to stay tighter because you have to do a lot of appearances and you need to be in better condition. But uh, Paul has got the phenomenal leg development. You see the incredible arms. Uh, this guy has been trying to turn pro for several times, and I just think that he hasn't hit it on the button. And uh, here, he's a little bit off. I've seen him a little bit better. And he's got a kind of body that the crowd loves. He's, he's a monster. And... Uh, uh, it could be a great pro. It could make a lot of money because of his uh, his freakiness. But uh, I think he's uh, he, he's got to hit it on the button one of these days. Why do you think he's off? Um, I think he overdyed it. I've seen him look so big in the off season, and then it seems like he uh, overdoes it to get the conditioning down. It says he has a slow metabolism, but I think he's losing a little muscle in the in the process. Well, but, he admits to that slow metabolism, so he should uh, know to deal with it. Tonight he looks better than he did in the pre-judging. Looks like he got rid of some of that subcutaneous water that he was holding. Well, we'll find out if it was enough. Hitting the most muscular for the crowd. They love that shot. Quadzilla de Mayo. Yeah, Paul was a great guy. You know, a very nice guy. Yeah. So, I mean, it was tragic what happened to him. It's funny when you look at these uh, shows from back then, the, the lineup was so deep, you know, the top five or six guys. Because they, any one of those guys could have won. Absolutely, that's right. And it took him like it would take him like DeMeo. It took like you know probably three or four years before he won because he had to wait his turn, you know, work his way up the ladder. He basically, uh, he um, DeMeo had to bring up his upper body to match. He always had the big, giant, great legs. Yeah, yeah. He his upper body more in proportion with his legs, and he did his tricep. If you don't realize that Paul had an unbelievable tricep. Oh muscle. yeah, I remember that side tricep pose. Yeah. One of the best ever. So, so, but out of these guys, I guess uh, Cormier and Francois were the ones that had the best uh, pro careers. Francois had a great pro career, but he just he had that colitis, and then that ended his career early. Be back. Well, let's move on to the heavyweight division now, and here he is on stage, Mike Francis. He's from Columbus, Ohio, two hundred and thirty pounds. Let's take a look at this, Mark. <laughs> incredible oh, development there was a rumor when the wbf guys came back that we might have to go re-qualify when i see guys like this i say thank god and speaking <laughs> of god mike was uh, a seminary student uh went th uh, through three years and then uh, married his present day wife so he's uh uh an incredible story that's mike francis funny story uh, what, what year did uh mike francois win the uh arnold i can't remember do you know what fan yeah, it was 95. Okay, I covered that show also for Weeder in 95. And uh, somebody had told me, you know, he was backstage with Chris Aceto, who I guess was his trainer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, somebody had told me that it was that night, the finals was Mike Francois' birthday. Yeah, it was. Right, right. Yeah. I went up to Mike. He's sitting there backstage with Chris Aceto. I walked up to Mike Francois, who I really didn't know, to be honest with you. I hadn't interviewed him or anything. And I said, hey, Mike, I said, I said, uh, I just wanted to let you know that uh, we found out that it's your birthday today. So when you come out, the whole audience is going to sing happy birthday to you. <laughs> and and uh, and uh, you remember I told this story about how Steve Reese gave you that cold stare? <laughs> the same thing. He just didn't say a word. He just looked, stared at me with this look like. You yeah. got to be kidding me. <laughs> you know what? Chris Aceto laughed. He got the joke. He knew it yeah. was a joke. Yeah. Francois just stared at me. 
And I'm thinking, she's another guy with no personality. Here we go. <laughs> Before I understand, he was a really nice guy. I'm a really nice guy. Yeah, I met him a few times. Yeah. I never really wrote. I don't think I ever, uh, I might have, no, I don't think I even interviewed him at the contest. I yeah. never writing on the guy, but people have told me. So, so I think he was really nervous and all that. Not, oh, know, sure. Yeah. The last thing he wanted was some guy to come up to him and say, you know. The right. <laughs> he wasn't in the mood for jokes at that point. I, I, I didn't. I thought about it later. I said, I shouldn't have done that, you know. But <laughs> <laughs> I heard it was his birthday. I couldn't resist, you know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, let's go over some of the other classes. So you remember John Simmons, the black guy from, I think, Detroit? Yeah, vaguely, vaguely. He won the light heavyweights. Poses. My name is John Simmons. I'm from Detroit, Michigan. And I want to say hello to everybody back at the gym at the powerhouse. And thanks, everybody, for their support. And especially to my wife, Lisa. You've been the star in my life. Thank you very much. Well, another guy involved in law enforcement, 32 years old, John Simmons from Detroit, Michigan, works there as a police officer. That's a rough spot to be a cop, let me tell you. Very much so, but uh, I think uh, th that profession allows them for a lot of uh, a time, you know, for training. I know a lot of cops, actually, that are good competitive bodybuilders. Uh, he's also got a brother who's a pro wrestler, Ron Simmons. Well, his athletic background is in wrestling, football, baseball, power lifting. There's another cop from Detroit, Michigan, a professional bodybuilder, Ron Love. Uh -huh. Well, you know, you got to kind of wonder here. This guy is pretty big. Uh, his brother is a professional wrestler, but he says uh, he doesn't really have any interest in becoming a professional wrestler. We really wanted to know why, and he was willing to tell us. Well, bodybuilding is, my, is more of my sport, you know, as far as wrestling. Uh, with him being in it, I'm sure it'd be no problem for me to branch off. But at this time, it's just not something I have a big interest in. Uh, I'm not ready to get thrown over the ropes too many times yet. <laughs> not just yet. Even though the money is fantastic, but uh, we'll, we'll see what happens later. He's won the 90 overall Junior USA, the 91 North American Light Heavy weight class, and he's trying to go three for three here. He might have it. Well, he looks good. He talked a little bit about, uh, you know, not wanting to get hurt as a wrestler. Re-injury is a serious problem for bodybuilders? The heavier you train, the more apt you are to, uh, to get injuries with uh, muscles and uh, tendons. Look at the striations there. That, all those mus muscular shots are great shots for him. And showing the leg separation here. Very even, the upper body to the lower body. The waist looks real small here. Just a, a very symmetrical, pleasing physique. Yeah, I, I think he's going to be tough to beat in this weight class, Mark. A lot of uh, big names. Rod Ketchens was second. Tyrone Felder third. None yeah. of those guys really went on to be pros. Yeah, I interviewed. I interviewed all those guys backstage at the contest. Okay. And then Vinny Galante took first in the middleweights. And Vin, uh, Vinny Galante, who's still around, still competing, still competing in the master shows. Master show, and he's in what late fifties or something. Yeah, thirty years later. So yeah, he's got to be. In good shape too. Got to he, had a, he had a great symmetrical physique though at that show. Very good, very good shape. bodybuilder to the fullest I want to be a professional um, if professional means that I that I don't turn pro in the rankings but I can make money from um, television or commercials or whatever anything like that sure bodybuilding has different doors that can open for me and I realize that now so I'm trying to make the, uh, the, the transition from just being a bodybuilder to open up all the other doors see what happens you know Size of that guy. Oh, 
at all. After the USA, I can't, I cannot goof around with my training. I can't just like say, hey, I'm giving me a break now. I have to mentally prepare for my diet because that, that's the biggest thing, your diet. When you goof around with that and you go out of shape and nobody's going to want you. So I was advised to stay on my diet, stay healthy, stay clean with uh, my training and stay clean with my diet and just don't eat junk. Don't junk up and don't get fat because nobody's going to want to see you. So this time around, I'm staying pretty, pretty uh, healthy. Well, there he is, Vinny Galante, and from that interview, I think you can tell he's got his head on straight. Yes, I, I met Vinny uh, several times at uh, various contests and. Uh, I uh, saw him a couple weeks before preparing for this. He's an extremely serious guy. He's all business. And he portrays that on stage. Watch this in the routine. Well, how did he get to look like this? Because this guy, to me, looks like just a cut above. This, this is a, a classical physique, Mark. Uh, you know, you, when you look at this guy, uh, it reminds you of uh, a Greek god. I mean, uh, he's just got phenomenal bone structure, uh, enough muscle in each body part, not a tremendously overly, overly muscular bodybuilder, but everything looks right. Uh, it's just a, a pretty physique. Well, you mentioned the water now with uh, Jose Figueroa. What do you see here with Vinny? Uh, no, that's not a problem with him. You can see the striations of the tricep and look at the pec. Uh, he's not holding any water underneath his skin. He's in good shape, and he looks like he's hit it on the button, and at this level, you got to hit it on a button to win your weight class and get a chance to turn pro. Well, I don't want to count anybody else out now. We're uh, seeing five competitors in the middleweight division here. What do you think? Oh, this guy was the guy to beat. You know, uh, well, him and Jose coming in, and uh, he hit it on the button, and uh, I, I think this is his day. Well, we're going to find out here shortly. He is our final competitor in the middleweight division. Getting in those final poses now. Poses very similar to his physique. You know, he's moving to classical music and a very smooth transition. And that's the type of routine that he needs to use for that kind of body. Look at these aesthetic poses here. That works great for him. He's a bone structure guy with uh, just a, a lot of pleasing amount of muscle. 26 years old, 176 pounds from New Jersey City, New Jersey. He knows how to show it, doesn't he? Yeah, and he's got the clean cut good looks, which doesn't hurt in the overall package either. Well, you take a look at him as we take a look at him along with the crowd here in Santa Monica. And then uh, Chris Faldo, who was a famous uh, natural bodybuilder from Hawaii. Uh, yeah, I remember talking. He won the lightweight class. That was his uh, first big national title. Yeah, I remember talking to him. Very nice guy, very personable guy. We're talking about Hawaii and all that. Yeah. Guy was he was super ripped. I knew Chris from back then, and uh, great poser too. Yeah, it was yeah. A lot of those. Uh, well, he he was Hawaiian, but I was gonna say like Oriental type. They're they're great posers, and Chris was a great poser. He put a lot of passion into his posing, you know. Hi, my name is Chris Felder from Honolulu White Train at the gym, and I'm out for the nationals. <laughs> well, uh, I'll say this about him. He's intense anyway. Huh? He starts out uh, out on stage here, 27 years old, uh, lifetime steroid free, he says. Yeah, he's clean for life, and and he's definitely <laughs> playing up to the crowd here. He's, uh, he's an enthusiastic young lad, isn't he? Great. Does he even know we're in the auditorium with him? I don't think so. I think he's blocked everybody out. I think he's just having fun up there. <laughs> it looks like he's Look in at the, the conditioning on him from the back. Wow. Look at the tie, the low, the spinal erectors and the strida glutes and the, and the pecs. This guy is lean. Uh, he's been training for 10 years, and he says uh, he used to be a 100-pound weakling who got sand kicked in his face. Uh, I dare you. I bet, I bet he's kicking sand back now. You know what? You look at this guy. This guy's done his aerobics. I, I would venture to say that he's done up to two hours a day of aerobics. You don't get that lean just by weight training and dieting alone. And the amount of years of training has definitely showed up in the quality yeah, ten but years. he's done some serious conditioning 10 years of training and as he says a natural bodybuilder and if his parents had anything to say about it that's the way it was going to be right from the beginning or not at all well i've been raised by two great parents my mom and my dad and when i told them i was getting into bodybuilding they knew the effects of steroids 
And they said, go ahead, son, do what you got to do, but don't take steroids at all. Other than that, from there, it was, yes, mom. It's always been that way. Yes, mom, yes, dad. And it brought me here to the USA all natural. I've been training very hard. I diet year round, only taking in junk foods only on Sundays. Very strict diet. And it, it sure pays off. I like to say to the bodybuilders out there that it can be done. And Chris Faldo wraps up the lightweight division with a flair. Nice to know he eats junk food once in a while. <laughs> Don't we all? It doesn't seem to show on him. Those are the lightweights, and we are coming back shortly to find out exactly how the lightweights finished and to take a look at the middleweights. There was another guy from Hawaii, I remember Alan something, can't remember his last it's name. It's what's that, what's that again? It's Oneasy. Yeah, I think that might have been him. Yeah. Another guy from Hawaii who I remember competing, a very nice guy. I think he won his class at the National, didn't he? But yeah, he did. As a matter Lightweights of fact. or something. He had super thick legs. Yeah, very nice guy. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know him that long. He's still in shape, still works out. Okay. Yeah. All right, let's go over the uh, the Nationals that year. So that was won by Mike Francois. And uh, Dennis Newman took second. So Dennis mo really moved up from the USA to the Nationals. One thing I have to say for Mike, Mike Francois is that he had a very complete physique. Yeah. Huge. He was thick, big calves, huge delts. I mean, the, he was a, he had a real pro professional level physique. Yeah, great back, huge arms, huge yeah. arms. I mean, I didn't really see any weak points on the guy. Yeah, and super thick quads, too. Remember how thick his quads? The teardrop was so big. He also had big calves, too. Yeah, yeah. To me, I look at a guy like that and I say, this is a guy who could be Mr. Olympia. Mm -hmm. He has all the tools. He has a full, complete body and he has mass and he's defined when he's in shape. This guy could go all the way. Westerville, Ohio, Michael Francois. Super strong. I don't know if you ever heard about his training. Oh, that I didn't know because I never interviewed him. Was he? Strong? Yeah, he he lived in uh, Westerville, Ohio, which I guess is close to Columbus. And you remember that guy, Louis Simmons? Yes, of course, the powerlifting guy. Powerlift. Yeah. So his gym was right out there, and he would go in there. He wasn't a powerlifter, but he would try to learn from the powerlifters, and he would train with them, which was an honor just to go into that gym because I guess it was a really small gym and the only people that were in there were world-class powerlifters. Like people would come from all over the world and Louis, train at that gym. Louis, Louis, Louis Sims had a big reputation. You know, he was very well known. Yeah. Kind of, what you just told me kind of reminds me of Ronnie Coleman because the, uh, the gym that he joined in Texas, uh, what was the name of it again? I can't, uh, Metro, what, Metroplex? Yeah, that was largely a powerlifting gym. Oh, okay. Ron, Ronnie Coleman first got into regular training. He was more or less indoctrinated into doing heavy powerlifting movements. 
heavy squats, heavy benches, heavy ropes. I mean, he, he that that's what he knew. That's the yeah, first. That was his world. It's not like he went into a, a direct bodybuilding type of training. He basically did semi powerlifting training. Mm -hmm. And personally, I think that contributed a lot to his gigantic physique. Yeah, right. oh, Lightweight. 747.5 pounds. All right. Yeah. Come on, Ron. Come on. Easy way. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
muscle strength and muscle size. I just don't buy it. I don't either. No. I, plus, I, I, plus, what I was always taught, you know, when I was a kid reading the magazines was when you lift heavy like that, you get a denser look to the muscles like Franco, you know, like Franco was so he trained so heavy. He had that thick, you know, dense look to the muscles, you know. And also, there's a getting back to what we said earlier, there's a relationship between training heavy uh, and retaining more muscle. Yeah. Because you lift, you know, you have different types of muscle fibers. <clears throat> they have the type one slow twitch muscle fibers. And you get that from using light weights and high reps, you know. Then you got the, the two types of type two muscle fibers, type, let's call it type 2A and 2B. Yeah. The two are what they call intermediate fibers. It has characteristics of the slow twitch and the fast. That's the fibers that you get when you do typical bodybuilding workouts of eight to 12 reps. Most of the muscle growth that you see in bodybuilders is the type 2A fibers, right? However, the two type B fibers, that's where the strength occurs. Mm. Only way, and I put this in big lead, is the only way to hit those fibers is heavy weights. You can't get any other way. But here's the good part. When you work those, when you, if you're able to work those 2B fibers, they last a lot longer. Mm -hmm. This is real muscle. So if you do mm -hmm. have to pay off, you're not going to shrink down to nothing. Right. If you're mostly like type 1 or type 2A, you can shrink down. But if you built a lot of 2B, you know, this is the secret of the bodybuilders of the golden era. That's why guys like Steve Reeves, Clarence Ross, John Grimmick, they can lay off for months at a time and, and still have most of their muscle because mm -hmm. they didn't know better. They had, they knew, they were taught, you got to lift heavy to get big. That was the mantra. Yeah. You didn't lift heavy to get big. Nobody thought about lifting lightweights back then. So these guys always hit their type 2B fibers. So if they had to lay off for even six months, I remember reading John Grimmick writing an article where he said he didn't he didn't train for a year, a year, and he <laughs> said he only lost a little bit of muscle. That to me is incredible. Yeah, because John Grimmick was started out as an Olympic lifter himself. This is a guy very oriented towards lifting heavy weights. Yeah, he built real muscle. Yeah, I think I told you that I had a hernia surgery a few years ago, and I think I had a week layoff like six eight weeks. The doctor said don't lift anything. Nothing heavy because you'll tear it again. You know, don't even go to the gym. And I was like afraid I was going to lose muscle and I didn't lose anything really. I got a little fatter from inactivity, but as far as muscle size goes, I, I really didn't lose hardly anything. What was my point exactly? You know, the, yeah, if you don't work out and you're taking a little bit too many calories because your body's used to burning extra calories, yeah, a layer of subcutaneous fat that's inevitable. But the fact that you retain, you know, your, your, uh, your uh, strength and muscle size. That shows that, you know, your training, and I know you like to train heavy too, mm -hmm. you up enough of the two type 2B fibers, they're going to last. I mean, you'd have to really go a long time to lose all that muscle. Yeah. And, uh, I don't recommend this for older people because older, once you get past a certain age, then there's a real danger of, of losing muscle a lot faster. But when you're a little younger, you'd be surprised how long you could, if you, if you hit those fibers, how long you can retain the muscle if for some reason you have to lay off. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and like we were talking about Mike Francois, I mean, the kind of training he did, I guess he got really strong. Now, when you were talking about like power lifters, though, and you said like a, a guy can bench press 500 pounds, he's got 15-inch arms, you know, but he's doing low reps. But I, I always felt, I always read, like this is, again, going back to like when I was 15 years old and I was reading the magazines, they said the more weight you can use for like 6 to 8 or 6 to 10 reps, the lower, kind of the moderate lower reps uh, the more weight you could use for that, that's what's going to really increase the muscle size. Yeah, it's because I think it's also because you're hitting the 2B fibers more with a slightly more reps. Mm -hmm. So I was talking about the 15 inch arms who can lift like heavy bench and stuff. That's a neuromuscular effect more than yeah. that. In other words, these guys through regular training and you do, you know, doing maximum lifts have developed extremely good neuromuscular connections where they're actually able to activate the muscle more, and that's what accounts for their strength. This explains why Franco Colombo was, you know, pound for pound, was stronger than Arnold. Mm -hmm. But he had a great deal more, neuro, and he also had the short limbs. He had more neuromuscular connections than Arnold would be the first to admit it. Yeah. <clears throat> he had, he, Franco had tremendous neuromuscular connections that made him very strong. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, I guess, well, Mike Francois, I guess, was he was training, learning these power lifts. But then when he went to his bodybuilding training, you know, he was able to squat like 600 for eight, 10 reps, you know. And then I guess with his training, he was going fast. Like he was using these super heavy weights with like only like a minute and a half rest in between, you know, sets. So I, I never saw any videos of his training, but man, it sounded brutally hard. So I was glad when he started winning contests because I was like, this guy puts in the work. You know, you could tell with his physique, he had to, even like his back had those thick spinal erectors. So you could tell this guy was a heavy trainer, you know. That too. But I, I think this guy, by doing that powerlifting stuff, he really built out the foundation. So just like Ronnie Coleman did. So he went into strict bodybuilding training. Uh, it was comparatively easy for him to build up even more muscle. Yeah, had a great foundation to begin with from doing those heavy lifts. So, but as far as resting a minute, you know, <clears throat> scientifically, <clears throat> excuse me, that's not the best for building strength and muscle size. No, right, yeah. What they found is if you really, and this is goes for anyone listening to this, if you really want to increase muscle size, you want to rest a minimal two to three minutes between sets, and there's a good reason for that, because when you do a set. You basically temporarily exhaust the energy supply of the muscle, including creatine, ATP, and you cause these fatigue acids to build up, right? If you don't give the muscle enough time to recover, the muscle can't completely regain its strength. Mm -hmm. and if you regain its strength, you're not going to get the maximum intensity. So if you're interested in especially, especially strength, uh, you want to rest two to three minutes between each set. And yeah. I break, I, I'm going to, full disclosure, I break that rule every time I train because I get to the gym late. I have to rush through my workouts. <laughs> Vince Garanda put me on a, a – when I joined this gym, he said, I told him I wanted to put uh, muscle size on. He put me on what he called the uh, – uh, I think it was called the six, 6 times 15, something like that. I don't remember exactly, but he had me do one exercise for six sets, six to seven sets. But here's the key. I only rested 15 seconds between. Oh, man. <laughs> myself, remember, I was doing like 20, 25 sets. I said, Vince, six sets? How are you going to gain go from six sets? He said, <laughs> just try it. So You'll see if it's easy. John, I'm telling you, after by the second or third set, my muscles were dead. Wow. Minutes, I couldn't recover at all. <laughs> I lost out the sets. By the sixth set, I was down to like three reps. I mean, yeah, muscle, yeah, right, right. I was only resting 15 seconds, you know? Yeah, yeah. That, that was an early indication of the importance of rest between sets. <laughs> yeah, I think when um, Mike said that, I think he was already, like, super strong. So then he was just able to, like, make his training more intense. But I do remember reading an article about him when he, I think when he first joined that Louis Simmons gym, and he was used to just doing bodybuilding training, and they were showing him how to get stronger. And whoever was coaching him said, just rest, hold on, wait, you know, don't. Don't rush to your set. He had to learn to wait, 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 like a power lifter did, you know, to to increase his strength, you know. Well, I'm sure the power lifters knew this just uh, from experience. Yeah. yeah. Knew, you know, even before these science studies came out, they probably noticed that if they rest a little longer between sets, they were stronger on the next lift. So that's how probably they knew it for years. Yeah. Just like bodybuilders, you know, uh, are way ahead of the general public in a lot of different things. Like, Bodybuilders were the first uh, population to start low carb diets before mm -hmm. any of these other people came out. They were doing it in the late fifties, early sixties. Mm -hmm. Were the first to do crunch sit ups, short range sit ups. Now everybody basically does sit ups like that. Mm -hmm. Started out in bodybuilding that you know trickle down to the public. Yeah, and, you know that that's. I don't know the point I'm trying to make. <laughs> well, yeah, it's it's the experience. We have the experience, and it's not just yeah. Kind of learn this by experience. Trial I guess and error, it's yeah. Historical <laughs> experience, and you you learn, you know, by it just uh, you know dawns on you that this is what works. Yeah. Um, I mentioned Dennis Newman got second in this class in '93 at the nationals. The 1992 California bodybuilding champion. He's only 23 years old. Weighed in at 249 pounds, Dennis Newman.
uh, the guy who was third was Edgar Fletcher. Oh, yeah, Edgar Fletcher. And I was reading an article about the uh, USA that Cormier won. And they said in the article that after the prejudging, it looked like Edgar Fletcher was one of the top guys in the show. But they said uh, as he posed, he was like fading. And then they said after the prejudging, um, he was cramping up really bad. So they were going to give him uh, potassium. And he said, no, no, that somebody like you, you know, you said, Jer, don't give him potassium because he's taking these potassium sparing diuretics. Right, right. Edgar Fletcher is one of those guys who they call the, uh, you know, uncrown. Uh, he should have been a pro in this. Yeah. Man. He had yeah. Been potential. I mean, he really was very good. Mm -hmm. He's kind of burned out, I guess, after a while because he's, I guess he was he wasn't really happy with the way he was placing, you know. But yeah, I mean, the cramping and stuff tells me that he must have done something wrong. He must have been severely dehydrated. He had an, probably an electrolyte or mineral imbalance. Mm -hmm. Might have taken some diuretics that drained out his minerals or something like that. That's what it sounded like. There's always a reason to explain that stuff, you know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I guess he didn't even finish that contest at the USA. He was one of the top guys, and then he never finished. So he did come back at the Nationals, but he got third. And uh, Don Long, who went on to win the Nationals a couple years later, too, he got fourth. So just goes to show you how incredibly uh, competitive these shows were back then, you know. Yeah. Fact, uh, the, the light heavyweight winner was Daryl Stafford. So he yeah. did. I think he did. He was a great light heavyweight for years. Remember when Sean Ray was winning it, and you know, he passed away a couple of years ago. Yeah, he passed away too. Yeah, I wasn't very old either. I, I don't know what happened to him. And he did turn pro, but he never did anything as a pro. No, that didn't do anything. He's right. I think he was from uh, Florida. So, right. nice guy, quiet guy, but nice guy. Uh, Robert Mello was the middleweight winner. I don't think he ever did anything as a pro but this was before they had uh 212 and everything right so these yeah. lightweight guys they really had no shot at the pros i mean they were uh, there's an old saying that you know a bigger guy is always going to be the smaller guy and yeah you know. yeah okay this ends up being a bit of a fist fight you've got so many physiques up there that are in fabulous condition there's nobody that's really weak up here Francois is the man that everybody's looking at because he is a heavyweight, and traditionally heavyweights dominate the pose down. But I wouldn't put Mello or Stafford or any of those guys away because they are all in fabulous condition. Now you see Steve Davis there right next to Michael Francois. If you're the lightweight or the bantamweight, don't you want to get away from the big guy because he almost dwarfs you in size? Well, some people would run away, but it, it's a point in Steve Davis's favor that he's going right after Michael Francois. He says, my physique's as good as yours. It may be smaller, but I'm going to go nose to nose with you. Matter of being aggressive, and you have to stay aggressive. You can't afford to sit back and, and let it happen because the judges want to see you out there really strutting your stuff. And that's exactly what these guys are doing. They're hitting their best shots. They're trying to show muscularity. They're showing that their physiques are ready to be the 1993 champion. And this is a really intense time, too, because it is just minute after minute of pure pressure and stress on your body, and you really have to be in prime shape, particularly at the end of the show. These guys have gone through prejudging, and they are tired. All they want now is to eat. All right, time to line up before they can chow down. We'll see what happens in the pose down as they line up and get the word from our public address announcer as to who is this year's men's NPC national overall champion. You see them lining up from the bantamweight to the heavyweight. Michael Francois on the end, Steve Davis on the left side of the street. So Michael Francois, our overall champion, and really no surprises there when you look at the condition he came in. Heavyweight is the traditional winner, and he's keeping the tradition going. So Michael Francois, not only the heavyweight champion, but also the overall champion here as he gets his congratulations from Neil and Steve Blackman from Twin Lab and co-promoter Steve Carroll and Tom Ciola also on stage. Jim Mannion, the president of the NPC, and Gene Behage from General Nutrition Centers. But the man in the middle, you see him there with both arms raised in victory, Michael Francois, the overall champion, and now some big things down the line for him. We'll be back with Michael Francois in just a moment. 
Welcome back to the 1993 Men's NPC National Bodybuilding Championships. With me is Michael Francois, this year's overall champion. And Michael, congratulations, sir. Thank you very much. Certainly a job well done, and in five years, a short time in the making. Yeah, I started, I guess, bodybuilding in 1987 was my first contest, and uh, ever since then, it's just been some local shows, and then two years ago, I guess, is my first national qualifier and uh, that I won. And uh, last year, the USA, this year, the USA, and now this. So. It's a long way, though, in the making. When you look at one year away from being ordained into the priesthood, and now here you are taking home the big trophy on, at the uh, yeah. NPC Nationals. It seems really incongruent in a way to have a, you know, be an other person-centered type thing as far as the priesthood, and then go into something like bodybuilding where you have to pour a lot of energy into yourself, but um, at the same time you can't do it with a lot, without a lot of help from a lot of other people. But, but yeah, it's... Uh, unreal for me to even really think about right now but uh it's uh, been a while and it's been you know some tough times as far as you know getting to the gym with all the studies and everything but uh it's paid off it certainly did pay off again congratulations sir thank you michael francois our overall champion and carla dunlap now joins me and what a story one year away from being ordained and here he is <laughs> taking home the prize and he found a wife in the making too well i'd like to know who pays his food bill because i'm sure his calorie intake has got to be well over ten thousand calories just to maintain that kind of weight but just some brief overall thoughts carla about the competition we saw here tonight well we did see that showdown between dennis newman and michael francois Dennis, coming in as a newcomer to the Nationals, is going to continue to do well. All the rest of the class winners are wonderful. I'm so glad for Billy Safford. I'm really glad for Daryl Stafford. Daryl has been trying to win this competition for eight years. He's tried to win his class for eight years. That's a long time. Congratulations to him, to everyone that has won their class at this Nationals. Again, though, our champion of the overall competition here at the Men's NPC National Championships, Michael Francois, taking home not only the heavyweight title, but the overall championship as well. For Rick Valente and Carla Dunlap, I'm John Walsh. Thanks for watching, everyone. That's like Franco used to uh, always complained about that, that, you know, he, he had actually had more, he felt that he had more muscle than Arnold. But yeah. Arnold beat him or placed higher because uh, he was bigger taller you know and this and that yeah and there's, there's some credence that i for years when i was writing for the magazines i always used to say listen they should have different divisions especially in the pro shows i mean because you know the smaller guys as muscular as they are they're not going to beat the big guys it's not going right. to happen right so you need a separate lighter weight division and i think i told you I, one they used to have those silly press conferences before the mr olympia at one year i was right around that time the early 90s I raised the question. I raised my hand and I said, I want to direct this at the whole panel, meaning all the guys who were competing were all on, on stage there. I said, how do you guys feel about creating a lighter weight class, separate class? I think they had it for a while in the Mr. Olympia. And, the, you know, they had like a, a what is it? I care. Under 200, over 200. Got rid of it, you know. Uh, and what do you think about bringing that back, you know, you know, you know to give you guys a chance? I mean, and I'm, I'm looking at Sean Ray and Lee Labrada, who are sitting up there on the stage. And I'm thinking, these two guys can win the Mr. Olympia themselves. They were Mr. Olympia material for sure. Yeah. I said, if they had a separate division, they would easily win it, right? And so who answers but sh my good friend Sean Ray? You know, <laughs> And Sean Ray, he says, I, I, don't, I, I don't like the idea of a separate division. He says, because I'm, I'm paraphrasing. It's not exactly what he says. He says, because he says there should only be one Mr. Olympia. Mm -hmm. and he, if you have a separate division, kind of takes away a lot of the prestige of having the Mr. Olympia title. So I'm against it. And Labrada agreed with him. Yeah. So surprised me. I'm thinking, don't these guys realize I'm trying to help them? <laughs> I mean, then I mean, I, I didn't want to say in public, but guys, listen, as great as you are, Sean and Lee, yeah. you're not going to beat. Lee Haney and, and uh, Dorian Gates, yeah. It happened. Yeah. Don't, don't you want some Mr. Olympia title? Yeah. <laughs> you want to wait for the Masters, Mr. Olympia. That's another right, right. <laughs> Yeah, and I thought Sean should have won that 94 Olympia. Yeah, where was that held? You remind me. That was in Atlanta. That was the year that Tor Dorian tore his bicep. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And Sean was really, man, I think that was the best he ever looked. I think he pushed him in uh, the Helsinki contest, too. Yeah, I do, too. Yeah. I remember after the contest that year in Helsinki, I think it was, what, 90? Was that 91 or 92? It was 92. 92. 
uh, I remember his brothers were just fuming. Oh man, with it, I thought they were getting a fight. Uh, one or two of his brothers were there. They were just fuming. Plus, they him. gave him fourth. He didn't even get second. He got fourth. That's what also made them mad. Yeah. Sharman, but he, his brothers were the ones that really were pissed off. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so the other one I want to talk about, the other uh, amateur show, was the IFBB North American Championships. And uh, that didn't have the lineup that the Nationals or the USA did. Um, David Fisher won. Do you remember David Fisher from Canada? Yeah, I do. Yeah. So I, think, I think now he Dave has a uh, gym in California, a powerhouse gym. He does have a gym. And he, he married a, a top female bodybuilder whose name, like, maybe you remember her name. I can't. I think she actually won the Nationals, female Nationals. Yeah, Sue, her. right? Her, her name was Sue? Yeah, yeah, I think that's it. She was a top bodybuilder herself. Yeah, yeah. He's another guy I never interviewed, Dave Fisher. I don't really know him. Uh, I do remember, I don't remember the, the the uh, you know, the, the, the what exactly happened. I couldn't tell you the context, but I remember him being kind of unfriendly. Mm. I, I might have tried to interview him, and he was kind of, you know, not very friendly. Yeah, just a, a vague recollection of it. He wasn't the friendly, you know. He's probably a really nice guy, but like I said earlier, you never know. You know, when you when these guys train for a show, you know the drugs, you, you know the the diet, the yeah. nerve, it can affect your personality where you're not oh, really yeah. best. And you know, if you catch him at that time, you you can get a, a you know bad impression of him. When you know, if you catch him at a different time, that you know, people tell me that, for example, Serge Oliva. Senior Sergio Oliva Senior was a really nice guy. They like him. To me, he was a bastard. He was every time I met him, he was nasty. But you know, that's just me. I, it might have been again. Maybe I could hook on him at a bad time. Probably but, died, and yeah. <laughs> a couple of times he was not in a contest. But his oh. son explained that Sergio Junior told me that his father was very moody. Mm -hmm. In a bad mood, he was a, he was very nasty. Yeah. I said, that way to you, he says yes. Yeah. That's his personality. He could either be a really nice guy or just a really moody prick. That's that's yeah. his first. <laughs> well, it's funny you mentioned the drugs because I knew a lot of guys. You know, I worked out in all these hardcore bodybuilding gyms for years, and guys' personalities would be completely different. I mean, if they were getting ready for a contest or even in the off season, if they were on drugs, they were assholes. You know, and then get them off a cycle, and wow, it's like a whole, who's this guy? I mean, it's like a totally different personality. Everybody who diet, you know, the diet is, and, and the dieting is hard enough, the dieting and the training. But if you add steroids to it, yeah, now you got a real personality change. Now yeah. you got something called roid range, which is a big debatable thing. I right. read articles about roid range. My conclusion is that it's more or less like you know, they they, they point out how steroids are supposed to increase aggression. The reason there's men have wars instead of women. Is because men have more. You hear all this stuff, and that's an you know that's how they're trying to explain roid rage. When you take a, a form of testosterone, whether it's testosterone itself or anabolic steroids, it increases the aggression and and, and rage and all this. But yeah. It shows that they, they you know they found that the men that the angriest of men. This is going to surprise you. The men with the most resting rage, I call, where they're mad all the time, like mad at the world. They have the lowest testosterone levels. Oh, really? <laughs> surprised when I found that out. Yeah, that is surprising. Second thing I, I realized is that steroids only emphasize what's already there. In other words, if you're a nice guy, basically a nice guy who treats people well, you're going to get irritable on steroids. Yes, you will. That's unavoidable. But you're not going to turn into a monster. Mm -hmm. But if you're a prick to start out with, you're going to be... <laughs> <laughs> when you take the steroids so right right it's the truth about roid rage i believe that because i i knew a lot of guys that probably weren't didn't have the greatest personalities or weren't the nicest guys and when they got on drugs they were just real assholes you know emphasizes that they, that's what they used to say about marijuana yeah in other words, if you smoke marijuana if you're already in a good mood when you start smoking you get in a better mood you get yeah. happy but if you're you know, in a bad mood it can make you worse where you want to just like get really pissed off and irritable. Yeah. So, so that, that's the way some of these things work, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then the lineup in that show, Stan McCrary, you remember Stan McCrary? 
pretty big black guy. He was in second. I, that's probably the best Stan ever did. I think, I think Stan right. did that in North America several times. I, I see Stan at the Florida shows. He's always around. He's still in the in the industry. Still in shape? Yeah, still pretty big, big guy. Yeah. He's he's real good friends with like Dexter and and a lot of the, the pros, you know. Okay. Uh the light heavyweight was Matt McLaughlin, who I really don't remember that much. He's big and with the yeah. The middleweight was Darren Mead. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, a lot of names here. It's it's weird how big the nationals in the USA was, but the North American, even though you get a pro card, uh, it didn't have the same uh, names, you know. I'm not sure if I was this. The, this was the '93 North America. Yeah. Who won that again? Dave Fisher. That wasn't at that show. That's why. See, as you're reeling off these names. Yeah. I'm, remember, I told you when I used to go to the big shows for Weeder, I would interview the top six of every class in all the shows. Yeah. And naming these names, I'm thinking, I don't remember this guy at all. Now I realize why, because I wasn't at that show. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, I want to mention the uh, world championships, which I think were still being drug tested, weren't they? The IFBB world championships? Yes, they were. But that's kind of debatable, right? I mean, these guys didn't really look drug free, you know? By that time, they had figured out a way to beat him. Yeah, yeah, I think so, yeah. So, Gunther Schlierkamp was the heavyweight winner. So, that was how he got his pro card. That Gunther, was that Gunther's uh, kind of uh, in, uh, initial uh, introduction to... Uh, I the believe so, yeah. 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 Because I remember him competing in uh, some of those shows in the 90s as a pro, and he was still much smaller than he became later on, you know. Of course, Gunther will always uh, have a distinction in bodybuilding history as being the only bodybuilder to beat Ronnie Cole, Ronnie Coleman. Yeah. Here that Ronnie Coleman won the Mr. Olympia when he was in top shape. Right, right. Bodybuilder that could say that. I was there at that. What year was that? That was 2002, I think. Yeah. yeah. And I went to that Olympia that year in Vegas. And, man, Gunther looked amazing at that. He was just – you know, we always talk about every once – like there's always one contest where a bodybuilder will just peak perfectly – he was so peak, like everything, his tan, his size, his cuts. And it was weird, too, because he wasn't supposed to be one of the top guys at that show. But when he walked out to do his routine, it was like the whole audience just got caught up in it. And Was this the, the same year that he beat uh, Ronnie, that same yeah, year? Yeah, yeah, because he, he ended up getting fifth in the Olympia. But I'm telling you, the whole crowd was behind him. Well, I'll tell you something now that – uh, the first year that I wrote, uh, that I started my Applied Metabolics publication, yeah, which was 2014, if I remember correct, I, I I got a hold. Somebody gave me a fax that basically outlined Gunter's entire drug and diet program that hmm. he used in all those contests. So I knew Gunter by then, you know what I mean. And I, I, I what I did is I wrote, I said what the I titled the out of what the pros really use. Wow. <laughs> wrote an article and I, I explained every one of all the reasons, you know, every, all the, 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 the drugs he's, how they work, why it would be included. I did an entire article, but I never identified him. All I said was he was a top five Olympia finisher. And I said, this particular, he, this, he was in the best shape of his life when he used this program. That's all I mm. wrote. I didn't want to embarrass him. You know, I wouldn't do that. But Was, you it, know, was it a lot of stuff? Oh, geez. <laughs> <laughs> ending the article by saying i more i said i said listen anyone reading this who competes don't even think of trying to emulate this i said, <laughs> I said because it, it would probably either put you in the hospital or kill you yeah I, yeah it was it was a horrific horrific uh drug program horrible wow. yeah horrible in the sense that it was uh bad for me but as far as from a health point very risky very risky mm. yeah you know, and Gunther himself, I remember him coming up to me not long afterwards. Uh, he had just met, uh, he started going out with a female bodybuilder whose name again escapes me. And and I guess he married her. Oh, yeah. And, and they wanted to have a child. And apparently he was infertile. And taking all that shit, he, he was in, completely infertile. Oh, yeah, that, that must happen a lot, right? Yeah, it happens a lot. Yeah. Said, Is there anything I could do to increase my sperm count? You know, I want to get my wife pregnant. 
So I gave him a couple of tips about, you know, I mentioned a certain hormone uh, that usually they give to women that would, you know, that, that, that it's a fertility drug. I said, but in men, it, it, it has a pretty powerful effect at increasing sperm count. I said, because he hadn't taken that. He'd been taking other stuff, but it wasn't working. I said, is that, is that ACG? No, it was HMG, human menopausal gonadotropin. Oh, okay. Uh, it, it, sti uh, it stimulates the, uh, what's, it, what's it called again? The, the Sertoli cells of the uh, uh, of the uh, testes where sperm is, um, in women it stimulates like egg production, all that stuff. But uh, I said, try it. Now, he never got back to me. But coincidentally, I'm not saying it was me. <laughs> Nine years later, his wife gave birth. Yeah. <laughs> Honestly, I, I, I honestly don't know whether he took my advice or not. I just found it it's interesting that nine months later, his <laughs> wife, birth, you know, so right. uh, happy for the guy. What can I say? You know. Yeah, yeah. I think Kim Lyons was her name. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. Yeah. But there was a good-looking guy. I mean, he, you know. Oh yeah, and he now there's a guy. You know, we're talking about Roy Rage. That guy was always in a pleasant mood, always smiling. He was amazing. It never added added. Yeah. He's an example. In other words, he was a nice guy, whether he was on drugs or not. And no matter how, I mean, the drug, let me put it this way. The drug program that I wrote up that he used, if you give that to a guy like Craig Titus, yeah. at least six murders, you know. <laughs> but, but, but you give it to Gunter, hey, how you doing? Nothing. No change. No, nothing. Nice guy, you know. I've, I've never seen that guy not smiling, you know. Whether he's in a contest or he's at an expo or whatever, I mean. Always, always nice to be. Very personable guy. Very yeah. nice. That's yeah. why he was so popular. People love him. I mean, he was a good-looking guy, tall. I mean, he had a great look, you know, great look for bodybuilding. I think he was, for a while, he was trying to get into acting or something. I don't. Yeah, he was. Yeah, yeah. I don't think it went anywhere. He, you know, he dropped a lot of weight. But, I mean, yeah. he had sport. He was tall. He was a very good-looking guy. When I looked at his face one time, he reminded me, if you ever look at photos of John Wayne, famous John Wayne actor, mm -hmm. young man, you know, and you look at Gunter, they had a little bit of a resemblance. Oh, really? Hmm. John Wayne was a handsome guy when he was a young guy, you know. Yeah. All handsome guy. And Gunter looked a little bit like him, you know. So I, when I heard he was trying to be an actor, I said, okay, so he has an accent. I mean, didn't seem to hurt Arnold. You know, maybe, no, you know, no. there's a break, see? See, the thing about Arnold, I'm not, you don't need to get off the topic. You know, Arnold has this new book uh, we talked about, you know, it's basically an inspirational book. Basically, he wants to outline uh, the secrets of his success, you know, how he, you know, accomplished all he did. <clears throat> now, that's all true. I'm not saying that if people don't follow those rules, so to speak, it, it is going to definitely help them because it gives them confidence. You know, it lets them, you know, everyone experiences uh failure but mm -hmm. if you have type of principles in mind you'll overcome the failure and keep going so that part is true the part that arnold doesn't talk about is that there was a strong element of luck yeah <laughs> happened to be in the right place at the right time and what i'm saying is even if you follow all the principles arnold talks about unless you're lucky mm -hmm. you're not going to emulate a guy's the success of a guy like arnold yeah it's just Happen. I could say the same thing about other people. Elon Musk, richest guy in the world. He happened to be certain circumstances. He happened to have a, a way. He, him and his brother started a small online thing. They had an opportunity to get into PayPal, and that's what started him. It just mm. happened. Thing, and now he's the richest guy in the world. If he yeah. didn't get early opportunity, I'm not saying he wouldn't have been a rich guy anyway, but he certainly wouldn't have been worth $225 billion. I mean, yeah. he's element of luck you know and i'm not trying to disparage anyone but you know it's like you, you always have to realize there's an element of luck you know you, you just have to be in the right place at the right time you yeah. know, to, there's a lot of people that do everything right and you know this i've seen mm -hmm. them i mean i've seen actors for example who do everything right they take acting lessons they do stage plays they get you know they get the eight by ten glossies they get an agent they never go anywhere nothing yeah. I mean, I got it. Oh, I'm not saying they get nothing. They get maybe a commercial here or there, small part in a movie. They, you never hear of these guys. Never. Yeah. Become, but yeah, I know there's like got to be some incredibly talented actors out there doing some small play that you never heard of. You know? Oh, uh, yeah, there really are. Or you musicians know? or whatever. You know? 
But the problem is they just don't get a break. In other words, yeah. the luck, sadly, is, is not on their side. You know what I mean? They, you know, they just, it just, that's just the way it is. Yeah. That's and I think we, we talked about this with Arnold when we were talking about his documentary, but you know, you look at what happened with him. You had Charles Gaines and George Butler do that book. And that's what really made, launched him. And then they did the movie. And also Charles Gaines wrote the book, Stay Hungry. And then they made that into a movie. And then he pushed for Arnold to be in the movie. So if he didn't have all that, and then you also had Joe Weider, right? Joe Weider. You know, the famous story, how Joe Weider talked these uh, producers into using Arnold the, for Hercules. The Hercules movie. Yeah. Famous Shakespearean actor yeah. in, in Europe, you know, he, he bullshitted his way in, you know. But of course, you can't discount the fact that Arnold had a unique personality too. Yeah, that, yeah, for sure. Because uh, if you look at, I think that definitely helped him in Hollywood. Because he, there's there's certain people that are just charismatic, and I know people like that, and they just draw people to them, and people want to help them. You know, like I have a friend, a friend of mine's like that, and he just. Everybody he meets, big, big people in the industry, they're just like, how can I help you? How can I? Because they love, they just, the charisma helps up, you know. A lot of people like that. And, and Arnold, uh, you know, he was kind of like a, a, people would look at him, they see this big, giant bodybuilder, and they expect this dumb guy who can't talk, uh, you know, who's uh, like, like a, a narcissist or something like that. Instead, yeah. the guy who's making fun of himself and laughing and joking. Disarming, yeah. And he disarmed them. And, and, and the thing is, uh, that helped him a lot. I mean, that yeah. kind of, hey, this guy is, you know, we could use this guy, you know? Yeah, yes. He still had to have an element of luck just to get into the situations that yeah. off him, so to speak. If he didn't, have, again, wasn't in the right place at the right time, I don't know. Arnold's a pretty industrious guy. He probably maybe would have stayed with the business stuff, you know, the real estate. He'd still be a wealthy guy, probably. Sure. He, Arnold, one thing about him, was always very, very ambitious. I know I'm well enough to say that this guy is extremely ambitious. Yeah, he, he could have started his own line of gyms or exactly. a magazine business or something, you know. I think he would have succeeded in just about anything he did. But, you know, again, the, the element of luck was needed to get as far as he did to the point where he is now, you know. Where... I don't want to get too metaphysical, but do you think, you know, you always hear about um, if you visualize something, then it, the universe lets it happen. You know, I mean, he was always a big believer in that. Do you think that because he visualized himself as a Hollywood star that the the pieces kind of fell in place as his life went on? I think he talks about it in his book. I think there's some truth to that, too. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, uh, Zane used to do that, too. We talked about that. Mm -hmm. uh, Zane visualized himself, uh, you know, winning the Mr. Olympia, He'd repeat these mantras over and over again, I will be Mr. Olympia, blah, blah. Yeah, yeah does it subconsciously gives you this tremendous self-confidence you know where you know you just you know you can't get discouraged you're you're basically immune to negative influences because so, you've already seen it you've already seen yourself winning so you know how could you not win yeah so that that does play a, a definite uh, role I, I think there's no question about it you know yeah so yeah, they, on a smaller scale, I always like I do uh, coaching, you know, and, and try to help people get in shape. And I, I notice that a lot of people when they start a, a fitness program, especially people who aren't used to working out like you and I are, you know, it's something new for them. They look at it as like a burden. They're like, oh, I got to go work out. I got to eat these foods, you know, and they, they're like really negative about it. And what I noticed Arnold always did when he was getting ready for these contests was he would always visualize himself as the winner already, you know? So then when he had to go through all that training and all that dieting, it was no problem because he was focused on winning the contest. He knew why he was doing everything where I think a lot of people who don't have that goal in mind, they don't see themselves as the, as the finished product. Yeah. You know, that's what they, they struggle with the day to day thing because they're not seeing the long-term pro the long-term goal, you know? And in the bodybuilding, there's another factor is that, if you visual, visualize yourself as already winning the contest, you can't be intimidated by, uh, let's say, competitors. Yeah. Remember the famous scene in, uh, I think it was Pumping Iron, where it's, uh, was it Eddie Julian? Somebody says to Arnold about uh, uh, Lou Ferrigno is uh, he's gay, he's really big, and Arnold just, you know, he just, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm ready, you know, I'm ready for him. And, you yeah, know, this I've already won. <laughs> See, the king of the hill can only go down. 
That's right. The king of the hill can only go down. Or There's stay no... up. Or he can stay on that hill. Right. That's the other the possibility. Can stay on the hill. Right. Stay up. But the, but the wolf he on the hill... Over the hill. But look, the wolf on the hill, right, is not as hungry as the wolf climbing the hill. That's true. See? He's not as hungry, but not when he hungry. wants the food, it's there. At the day of the contest, if he comes in his best shape and he's equally as good as I am, or if, let's say, he's a few percent better as I am, I spend with him one night. I go downstairs and book us together in, in a room, you know, to help him for tomorrow's contest. And, uh, and that night, he will never forget. I will, I will mix him up. <laughs> he will come so ready to South Africa, so strong. But by the time the night is over, the next morning, he will be ready to lose. I mean, I will just talk him into that. That's no problem to do, you know? In other words, Arnold cannot be intimidated. Right. You know, somebody came up to Arnold and said, hey, Sergio Bray is looking really good, or this guy, that guy, or Sergio Oliva. Wow, he's gigantic. He's a freak. This and that. Arnold, he, he already saw himself winning. Yeah. That stuff to one ear and out the other. It just, you know, so that's where the visualization, visualization, it's a tremendous self confidence tool. Yeah. Self confidence really is important for any type of success in any endeavor, whether it's bodybuilding or business or even personal relationships. Yeah. Self confidence makes a huge difference. Very important. And I think in bodybuilding, because it's subjective and you just have a bunch of judges giving their opinion and they're, you know, they're, uh, they're prone to being subjected, you know, to being influenced, I guess. So yeah. if you get a competitor like Arnold who gets up there with all this confidence, he right. can't see any other outcome except him getting first. That trans translates over to the judges, you know, and yeah. that has an effect on the judges, you know. It really does. I mean, like when Arnold was posing, it's like, you know, like like he's saying, look, look at this. Look, I already won, you know, just yeah. let, it's over with. And I, I think like it's almost hard for the judges to put him in second. But yeah. I got to you know? yeah. Well, it's almost like how, how even the audience can influence the judges, you know? Yeah, yeah. 66 Olympia, when when Larry Scott got the 20 minute standing ovation, right. <laughs> I don't think that that influenced the judges. Right. Yeah. Situation like that, think about it. How could the judges possibly let yeah. Apple, the man who got second win? It's yeah. like they couldn't do it. Yeah. They couldn't do it, even if they thought Harold Poole was the better man. Just the mere fact that uh, that Scott was such an audience favorite, he had Paul had no chance of winning. Yeah, <clears throat> none. <laughs> yeah, we we've, we've talked about the eighty Olympia so many times, but I think there was a guy was it Vince Basile, I think from uh, Australia. He was at the eighty Olympia in Australia, and he was taking all these shots, you know, and he was so busy, like uh, taking the pictures, uh, and then he was watching the contest and taking pictures, you know. So he said when he was watching the show in person, he had Arnold in first place. Then when he got home and he studied the slides, he had him like in fifth. Right. So it was the the influence Arnold had, you know, his charisma and everything made a difference with where you were going to place him, you know. Sure. You know, when Arnold's posing, when he does those, you know, twisting back and he shows that giant bicep and, and the yeah. huge, you know, you kind of like Focus, it's like I said with Larry Scott, when we talked about him a, a while back, I pointed out how Scott was very masterful in his posing because he had a very weak back. He didn't have any wide lats. He had narrow shoulders. But what he did is all his poses emphasized the absolute tremendous shoulder and arm development he had. So he, he kept going like this. And when he do a, a back shot, he twists and show his arm. Yeah. You know, it was arm and shoulder, arm and shoulder. Right, so, right. <laughs> focus and say look at this guy's physique but you were looking at his arm and shoulders right and said, of it was mediocre and he had no back and it's right. like you keep looking at those unbelievable shoulders and arms and that made him one and that's what that's what probably happened with this guy vince i mean he's looking at arnold post and seeing that arms yeah well, i wasn't at that sydney olympia but it, even in the photos when arnold flexed his arms i have to admit i think anyone would agree he did make the other guys look like tiny little guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He approached his arm development. Right. Focus on that. It get, it kind of hypnotizes you into th thinking, <laughs> oh, yeah, Arnold just won again. Yeah. Yeah. But 
really break it down like afterwards and look at the photos, you realize Arnold was not at his best. Right, right, right. That's the, it's like a trick people put, you know, uh, do on themselves. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I thought John Brown's son was going to win the uh, football game and go to the Super Bowl, but they lost. Oh, that's too big. Oh, gee, that's a shame. Close, close game though, twenty four to twenty one or something. It was like three points. Wow. They were winning at first, and then they lost. Well, John Brown would have been well. He's proud of his sons anyway. You know that. Well, oh, his his one son is really good. The one that's on Detroit, man, he's really good. He's yeah. one of the best players in the whole team. I met them uh, when John came. He brought them to a, one of the Muscle Beach shows. I met. Yeah, them. yeah. Oh, guys, they were like towering. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Brown's a tall guy. They were towering over him. Wow, they're taller than him, huh? Yeah. Wow. Old guys. Like yeah. six five or something. Yeah, no, they were yeah, something like that. They were big guys. You know. Jeez. They were very nice guys. Uh the one other show I wanted to mention before we go talk about the pros, Jerry, was the teen teenage nationals, the MPC teenage nationals. And that was notable because two guys that went on to become really good pros, Branch Warren and Jay Cutler. Both won their classes. Branch Warren won the overall, but Jay Cutler, at uh, 19 years old, won the the heavyweight class. And man, you could see this guy was going to be a pro bodybuilder only at 19, right? Oh, that's the year I met him. I did that little article on him in Flex. Yeah, because, you know, I could see the potential. You know, I mean, uh, this guy definitely had pro potential. There's no question about it. Yeah, yeah. especially his legs. He had the uh, Jay always had those crazy sweeps. You know, yeah. it doesn't even look real. And not only that, he had, he had like cross cuts in his quads. I mean, you know, we don't see that that often of big guys, you know? Yeah. I mean, he, he probably had better legs at 19 than most guys will ever develop in a, a lifetime of training, you know? I, I remember commenting him. I said, Jesus, I said, I never had legs like that. I, yeah. I remember telling him that. Me neither. I remember when he won the uh, Nationals and only, I think, it, let's see, this was 83 or 93. 96, he won the Nationals, so he was, what, like 22 or 23 or something. Um, but he won the heavyweight class, and I remember – I never heard of him, and I was reading an article in Flex Magazine that had his leg routine, and his quads were so big. And he said in the article, he goes, I don't even squat. And I'm sitting there reading the magazine. My knees were sore from squatting so heavy. I go, my legs are half the size of this guy. God, what genetics, you know? The genetic thing is right. Yeah. yeah. And he was wide. He had the wide shoulders, you know. So he must have realized. I mean, I'm sure he was very passionate about bodybuilding. But I know he's a bit. Joey Jay's a good businessman. God, he's worth millions of dollars now. Yeah, but uh, he must have realized at a young age that if I do everything necessary to be a pro, I could probably make a really good living at this. You know. Well, I remember him uh, entering. I don't remember what year it was in the '90s. He entered one of the Night of the Champions shows in New York. He'd already yeah. turned. And he bombed out. He didn't do that well. And, and I remember him saying to me, he said, he, he said the same thing that Nasser El Sambadi said to me right around the same time, a little bit earlier. Nasser's a little bit, a couple of years before. Nasser, who for some reason wanted me to call him Jimmy. I don't know why, but he. <laughs> uh, Jimmy? I, I, that's what he asked me. To call him. Oh, that's funny. Night of the Champions and didn't even place in the top 15, right? And I saw him uh, a couple of days later outside Gold's Gym. There was a bench right outside the gym. And I had spoken to him at the contest. And I sat next to him, hey, how you doing, Jimmy? You know, he, says, <laughs> he says, he says, you know, had that accent. Jerry says, I know that, I, he says, I didn't do well in this contest. But trust me, in about four or five years, I'll be one of the top five pros in the country. And I remember saying to him, I said, well, I, I believe it. I, you're a big guy. All you got to do is refine your physique. And I could see it. Mm -hmm. He said the same thing. He came up to me in the gym after he burnt, bombed out of the night of the champions. He said, he said, in about, he said about two, three years, I'm going to be like a top Mr. Olympia con competitor. He didn't say Mr. Olympia, but he said he, he definitely would be in the top three. He told me that. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they both of them. You know, wishes came true. What can I say? Yeah, I remember Jay's first Olympia in '99. He was one of the. He placed almost last. Yeah, yeah, that was. I don't think he should have. I was at that show, and uh, that was the first year it was in Vegas. And I thought he had a great physique. I mean, I thought he definitely got overlooked. I think that was around the same time that we had that conversation. Okay. 
he you know he wasn't doing that great in the shows. But I, I looked at I, I think he won the Night of the Champions the next year in two thousand. So I think that was the, the start of his, you know, rise. Yeah. Yeah. But he had to know being that good at nineteen, he had to know that he had the genetics to go all the way, you know. Yeah, all they had to do was stick to it and refine yeah. it because it bigger. And the rest, you know, and then that was the rest is history, as they say. You're that big as a teenager, man. He had these big bones and stuff, big structure. Yeah. Like a lot of muscle on, you know. You know I mean, that famous shot of him on stage, you know, you know the one where he's like, look, you know, he has extending the one leg with oh, the arm. quad stump. Yeah. That's a phenomenal shot. Yeah, it is. When I first saw that, I thought it was Photoshop. I know. <laughs> I mean, even for Jay, that's a little too big. But yeah, you know, that was amazing. Boy, he really looked. Yeah, that's one of the best pictures in bodybuilding. Oh my God, did he look? He was a monster in that picture. Yeah. So. And Branch Warren looked good too. I mean, you remember Branch when he was younger? He had, I mean, he came, he got sort of, I guess, blocky looking a little bit when he got really big, you know. But when he was younger, and even as an amateur when he was in the Nationals, he had a smaller waist and really good V shape. Yeah, he, as he put on size, that happens with some guys. And when they put on size, they start to get a little bit of a blockier look. Yeah. Because he was extremely vascular and he looked very muscular. He used to win the most muscular a lot. You know, he had a very muscular looking guy. Yeah. He was pretty strong, too, uh, from what I understand. Didn't he have some sort of mishap before a show where he fell off a horse or something like that down in Texas? Well, he tore his, uh, he tore his patella tendon slipping on ice. Oh, was that it? Okay. Yeah, and then he won the Arnold the next year. Okay. That was amazing, you know, that he was able to come back in less than a year and win. I mean, that's, that was really phenomenal. He married a female bodybuilder, too. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah he's he's a really, really hard worker. That guy's a, you know. Yeah. I, I remember him seeing him training with, uh, what's the name of that guy who died not long ago? He won the... Uh, Nationals one year, uh, he died of kidney failure. I can't remember his name. Oh, Tom Prince. Tom Prince, that's it. Yeah. I saw them training at Golds one year when they were both in top shape. Very heavy, monstrous training guys. Yeah. Phew, monstrous, heavy weights and stuff. And jeez. Branch is uh, retired. He still trains like that. I think he's still he's still big. He's still really big. Is he? Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Good. 